Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Kelsey Gibson. I'm going to be your host for today's LabKey webinar. Um, today, if you experience any technical difficulties, please feel free to reach out to me, either in the chat panel, in your GoToWebinar interface, or via email at kelseyg at labkey.com. Today, our presenter, uh, Adam, is going to be covering um, LabKey server in compliant environments. He's going to go through a little bit of an overview of our existing functionality and then the new additions of, uh, that have been added throughout this year and that are upcoming with our 17.3 release. So Adam, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. All right, great. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, it is a great morning to talk about regulatory compliance. And my hope is that we make this fun and exciting, or at least interesting. Um, it's obviously a very important topic uh, for many of you. Um, and it's an important topic for us. Um, so with that, uh, let me just start by saying that um, LabKey, uh, we like to think that we've always been uh, very compliance friendly. Uh, by that, I mean uh, we have invested from the start in a very flexible and robust security framework, and we've worked hard to ensure protection uh, against security vulnerabilities, uh, both of which are absolutely key, key foundation for addressing any of these uh, regulations um, and being compliant. Um, without those, without a good security model and protecting against vulnerabilities, uh, you really can't have a compliant system. Uh, we have also, for quite a few years, uh, had some basic handling for protected health information, PHI, and personally identifiable information, PII. Um, handling that in the, the core platform, in the community edition, um, in particular in uh, the areas of study export and publish study uh, where folks like the Immune Tolerance Network and uh, Dr. Dave O'Connor's lab at University of Wisconsin uh, publishing uh, real-time Zika data have been able to use these mechanisms to de-identify uh, clinical trial data to remove identifiers and other uh, potentially sensitive information to um, uh, to uh, shift uh, patient and participant level dates uh, to mask certain aspects of that data to make it possible to publish that data. We've also uh, for for several years now uh, worked directly with some of our clients to develop custom modules and custom schemas um, capabilities that allow them to deploy their instances of LabKey server in a compliant manner. Um, in particular, uh, with a focus on protected health information, patient data, and adhering to the, the controls of HIPAA. Um, so we've done that for specific clients. We've deployed LabKey uh, as in a HIPAA compliant and FISMA compliant manner uh, for those particular clients. Um, all of that is good, uh, but it really is not enough. Um, and we decided late in 2016 that we wanted to really improve the support for regulatory compliance for everyone across the product. Um, so that became a strategic objective, uh, really a company objective for 2017. Um, and that led to a plan where we decided to, first of all, generalize some of those custom compliance features that we had developed for specific clients through the years, um, and really to harmonize and reconcile those with some of the PHI handling in the core platform. Uh, we also realized we needed to design and develop new capabilities to address, address gaps, to address additional controls that we weren't already addressing uh, within the product. We also made the decision to start offering uh, compliant hosting options to our clients. So this is, I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail a little bit later, um, but we, we see this as a, a great complement to the features that we're developing in the product so that clients could make a decision to uh, deploy LabKey on their own and configure LabKey in a compliant environment or to work directly with us 
to build that type of data center, a compliant data center where they can, um, where they can then host data in, in a compliant fashion. Now our plan uh, has focused on HIPAA, FISMA, and CFR Part 11, um, those particular regulations, um, but we feel these enhancements are, are relevant to other countries, other regulations, um, and perhaps contractual agreements or internal policies uh, that, that our clients may have. So for example, we have some important clients in uh, the UK uh, that are subject to the Data Protection Act of the UK and we have used these same capabilities we developed to address HIPAA compliance uh, to address their needs and their requirements in, in their jurisdiction. Uh, likewise, uh, even for clients who are not at the moment subject to HIPAA or FISMA or Part 11, uh, you may have data use agreements or with collaborators or internal policies um, where you could benefit from using some of these controls, some of these features that we've developed because they've been built in a, a fairly general purpose way. So it's important to, to uh, mention and to, to emphasize that regulatory compliance is, is not a button or a checkbox. You know, there, there's not a single feature within LabKey that says, make me compliant. Um, instead, what we provide is really a, a, a comprehensive set of building blocks that help you comply with these regulations. Um, there's, you still need to be uh, familiar with these regulations. Um, you will interpret them in certain ways, you will develop policies, you will make decisions, you need to be responsible for validation and documentation along the way. We can help you with that, um, but, but it, is, it is important to remember that LabKey itself is not ever compliant. Um, you build a system that includes LabKey that then your use of that system uh, complies with these these regulations. So the regulations themselves, I'm not going to read all these details. This is really, these are very short summaries of, of these certain, of these regulations. Um, and I, I'm trying to emphasize the parts that are particularly relevant to LabKey Server and the deployment of LabKey Server. In a nutshell, HIPAA, of course, addresses human, patient, medical record information, health information, and protects that and, and ensures that that information is used only when absolutely necessary. Um, so many of the features where we talk about PHI, protected health information, uh, those tend to relate to HIPAA. FISMA addresses um, sort of more basic information security, um, set of best practices and controls that um, uh, under which computer systems should be run. Um, so when I was talking earlier about our security framework and our authentication and authorization and all of these uh, pieces, those deal with uh, FISMA controls. Um, and then uh, CFR Part 11, um, that is an FDA regulation that deals with electronic records and ensuring that they are trustworthy and reliable and um, uh, an electronic record can be equivalent to a paper record. So as far as the details of today, um, we're going to look at a few different areas. Um, first of all, the what I call the foundation for compliance. Um, the capabilities we built into LabKey from the start that enable a compliant deployment. Um, and this top point, um, I, I put it in parentheses because I'm not going to talk about it any further, um, but hopefully it goes without saying that your network security, your server installations, uh, keeping your, uh, your operating system and your uh, dependencies patched and up to date and configured correctly, these are all absolutely critical to a compliant environment. Um, if, 
you need to follow best practices. Um, LabKey can help you with those best practices and can, can help you um, get your systems up and running in, in a secure manner. Uh, but that's absolutely uh, critical to any compliant deployment. So today we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about authentication, authorization, and the logging services that LabKey provide. These all form, form that foundation that compliance is then built on top of. We'll then move into some of the specific features we've developed to address um, controls within these regulations. Um, and then we'll move to talk about how you might configure uh, a server for to address HIPAA, FISMA, or Part 11 compliance. Sort of the looking at, for those particular regulations, which of these features should I use? How might I configure them, or at least um, in, in a sample configuration, um, how they fit together? We'll talk a little more about the hosting options, and then um, talk about what's coming in the, in the future. So first, uh, in order to address any of, these, uh, any of these controls, you need to be able to reliably identify your users. Um, so that's what authentication does. Uh, LabKey fortunately has many mechanisms for authenticating users. Uh, you need to choose the appropriate runs for your deployment, for your institution. Um, as, as you probably know, LabKey has database and LDAP authentication built into every edition of LabKey. Um, and then some single sign-on institutional-wide um, authentication mechanisms are available to premium clients. Uh, the only, you know, the one key thing I want to mention here with regard to compliance is that database authentication needs to be configured with strong passwords and password expiration for just about any uh, regulation that's out there, FISMA, HIPAA, etc. cetera. Um, and so that looks like, uh, hopefully you've seen this configuration page before, uh, within LabKey, you want to choose that strong option and specify password expiration of an appropriate uh, length three months, six months, 12 months are, are some of the options available within LabKey. Um, this ensures that uh, your, your users have, have chosen reasonable passwords and that they are uh, changing them on a regular basis. So authorization uh, really comes in two parts. First of all, you need to partition your data appropriately. Uh, we, we typically talk about partitioning data into folders um, in some cases, we call these data portals, um, but in either way, either, either case, uh, they are a standard folder mechanism within LabKey. You have a number of ways to do this. You can import your data directly into those folders. You can uh, use a custom schema or an external schema uh, where the tables have a container column, and that container column acts to partition the data into the appropriate folder. There's another mechanism uh, you may have come across uh, called linked filtered schemas. Um, this is a more uh, sort of a, a sophisticated mechanism that allows, uh, allows an administrator to partition data in a table um, based on an ad hoc filter. So for example, in some of our, in some of our uh, compliant uh, systems that are out there, patient data is partitioned based on the institution uh, that originated that data or based on that patient's um, primary physician or based on a disease group or perhaps a study protocol they may be participating in. So those arbitrary or more ad hoc filters are used to automatically partition the data into the appropriate folders. Um, so that's a mechanism that we can help you with if, if that's of interest. Once your data is partitioned, you need to control the access. Um, typically, the, there are a number of ways to do this, but, but the typical mechanism is that users are assigned to security groups, and then roles are assigned to those groups within each folder. 
as appropriate. So administrators do this um, to ensure that only the right people get access to uh, the appropriate data. Importantly, uh, in addition to actually setting all of these permissions, you can review permissions using the impersonation feature and using the security reports that are provided by the system. Now, of course, this really only scratches the surface of authentication and authorization. I want to encourage you to look at the tutorials. Um, we, of course, cover these topics in all of our trainings with our clients, um, and there's great documentation as well up on our website. Event logging uh, is an important service um, built into LabKey really from, from pretty much the start. Um, we call this, uh, in the product, it's called the audit log. Um, and this audit log captures information about many of the actions that users take. Um, this is absolutely critical to compliance. Much of compliance is about documenting your policies, documenting your procedures, documenting your configuration, and documenting what actually happened. Um, and being able to go back and review that information and ensure that users followed their terms of use and their, um, uh, you know, followed the, the rules uh, that, that they know. The audit log can be viewed by administrators. Uh, it can be queried, it can be filtered, it can be exported. It is a table like any other table within LabKey um, that can be manipulated in a variety of different ways. Uh, administrators, however, no one can delete records, individual records, or alter them. So they are saved for all time um, and can be reviewed at any point in the future. The audit log collects events, user events in 30 different categories, probably more than that, um, really across the board. Some of the more uh, built-in or, or core of those include user events, login events, permissions, uh, downloads, changing of settings, etc. All important things to, to monitor. So let's talk about a few of the compliance specific features. Uh, I'll start with uh, one that's in the community edition, the ability to export studies and publish studies um, while uh, stripping that data of protected health information. So basically the, the approach here, um, this was originally developed um, working with the Immune Tolerance Network. In their case, they wanted to publish clinical trial data, uh, but they needed to de-identify that data. Um, so at, at this point, we, we've actually um, modified this mechanism a little bit over the last uh, couple of months. Um, and so the, the mechanism works uh, as follows. So basically, columns are annotated by an administrator um, via metadata. Uh, so study data sets, lists, specimens are all annotated. The columns are all annotated with one of four PHI levels to indicate whether this data is de-identified or not PHI at all. If it's limited PHI, for instance, uh, visit dates and, and the like, full PHI or restricted. So these levels are assigned by an administrator. And then at the point that we, uh, that someone chooses to export or publish a study, LabKey offers some options. We can omit columns that are annotated at or above a specified PHI level. We can shift participant dates um, by an offset um, that is stable for that participant, but randomly generated and not guessable. We can also mask participant IDs and clinic names in the process, and thereby creating a published study that has removed uh, identifiable information. And, and previously, if, if you're familiar with this functionality, that used to be labeled protected. There used to be a single bit on every column. That is now replaced with these PHI levels to uh, give some additional flexibility and to reconcile it with the HIPAA functionality that we've developed previously. 
So just to look at a couple of screenshots of this process, um, you can see here the what we call the the uh, domain designer or the the metadata editor. Um, in this case, I am marking the birth date column as limited PHI. Um, over on the right, you, in lower right, you see the PHI levels being set to limited PHI. That is the annotation process. And then at the point I choose to export or publish a folder or a study, um, you can see the options up above, which show uh, my ability to remove PHI columns um, at or above a certain level, um, and also to shift dates, um, export alternative uh, participant IDs, or mask clinic names. So now I want to move into some of the features that are available to uh, premium edition uh, subscribers. Um, first of all, um, and, and these are all previously developed for um, specific clients and now brought into uh, the compliance module, uh, which is available to all um, Professional Plus uh, premium edition subscribers. So first of all, the activity dialog and terms of use. These are features that really go hand in hand. Um, the goal here is to capture uh, a user's assertion about their current role and optionally their IRB and the PHI level that they require for their current use of the system. This is very important for HIPAA um, to uh, require users to state, yes, I need to see protected health information at a particular level to to achieve my current my current goal or my current current role requires this um, so they're asserting that they need this PHI level and then they must agree to terms of use that match those assertions the role the IRB level or the IRB and the, the PHI level so this is configured by administrators and enabled on a folder by folder basis although there is the ability to inherit in a folder tree to make that easier to configure. Um, users cannot access anything in that folder until the activity dialog is filled out and the terms are confirmed. And if they choose to visit another folder, a different folder, they'll have to do it again. Uh, they'll essentially switch context and they need to, again, specify current role, IRB, PHI level for that particular folder. This whole system uh, makes use of the event log. So all of the properties that are specified and the full uh, set of terms that the user agreed to are stored as events in the audit log um, and can be audited, reviewed, audited uh, in the future. So here's the, the basic user interface or an example of it. Um, when I first go to uh, my data portal or my folder where this has been configured and enabled, I must specify a role. Uh, in some cases, I'll specify my IRB number. I will choose a PHI level, hit next, and then the appropriate terms of use, terms of use matching those assertions, uh, show up. You can see there are multiple stanzas here and that the system allows an administrator to configure uh, certain paragraphs of information that apply to uh, specific choices on the previous dialogue. Now, uh, I want to address uh, the issue of restricting protected health information and logging all of those accesses. This is key for HIPAA compliance. As I said up front, um, one of the tenets of, of HIPAA is that only the people who are required to see protected health information should be able to. Um, and so LabKey has a, has a facility um, to, allow, uh, to allow schemas to essentially adapt based on the user's permissions, um, or in this case, PHI roles. So in other words, we want, to, we want the system to show or hide PHI columns dynamically based on the user's current roles. In addition, anytime PHI is viewed, we want to log that. Uh, we want to make sure that 
uh, for auditing purposes, every single PHI access is recorded um, so that we can, we can run queries in the future that say, tell me all of the patients that this particular user viewed and what information they viewed. Or uh, show me every user who accessed the records of this particular patient, when they did that uh, and what they looked at. So the workflow here is, is similar to what you saw with publish, uh, publish study and an export study. An administrator annotates columns with PHI levels. Um, and then when each user views the data, they only see the columns that match their current PHI roles. Uh, so if, for instance, I go to look at a data set uh, and I only have the ability to see de-identified data, all of the columns marked as limited PHI, full PHI or restricted, will be invisible to me. Now, administrators have an option here. Um, there, are, there are reasons to go one way or the other. Um, administrators can choose to hide the columns that are considered PHI or above the current PHI level, or they can show those columns, but LabKey will, will ensure that those values are, uh, or that column is blanked out. As I say, every PHI access is logged, including the patient ID that, patient ID that was accessed and the columns that were accessed. Um, and, and I should say this, this is one feature that we are actually actively working on right now. It's actually on the board for September. Um, so it's not implemented right now, but it will be coming uh, very, very soon. Looking at that workflow, um, this, is, this screenshot is exactly the same. Uh, we use exactly the same mechanisms, annotating PHI levels with, uh, with limited PHI. Uh, and then I need to actually assign one of these PHI roles uh, to the users and groups within, within my system. Um, so in order to see any of those annotated columns, uh, I must be assigned one of the roles here. So at the moment, on, on this particular folder, um, no one would be able to see those PHI columns. It would be a de-identified folder, effectively, which could be useful in, in some cases. But if I assign these roles to certain individuals or groups, those individuals or groups will be able to see uh, the appropriate PHI columns. And then in terms of the event log, um, it will end up looking something like this, uh, where uh, we see a list of column names um, under logged columns in this case, and a list of patient IDs uh, or participant IDs um, in the case of identified data. This is available only, only to administrators, but this is the mechanism that would allow us to filter based on a particular user, a particular patient, um, or for that matter, a, a particular column that might have been accessed. Now, an important note about API use. Um, so that activity dialog and the terms of use, I said earlier that, that with that in place, um, a user must enter that information and agree to the terms of use in order to access any aspect of a folder. That holds for API calls for our client libraries. Um, so by default, a client library can't actually call into that folder, retrieve data from that folder. Now, that may be desirable, that may be what you want. Um, since an API can be used to extract data in bulk out of the system, which is a potential security risk. Um, if I can extract lots of patient data into a file on disk or Excel or something else, bad things could happen. Um, so that may be desirable. Um, However, there may be cases, you know, if you need, uh, for instance, your uh, analyst to be able to use R to access this data and run some analysis, um, you need some way to enable that, in that case, R lab key, the R lab key client library. Um, so we've developed uh, a capability we call API session keys. Um, that needs to be enabled by an administrator. Once enabled, uh, 
then users who uh, use these libraries uh, can log into the system, go through the process of specifying their activity, their IRB, their PHI level, etc., agree to those terms of use, and at that point they can capture a token from the system and use that within their API use to authorize the usage. And then the system effectively uh, ties those library calls to the terms of use and the activity that that user agreed to via the web UI. So that looks something like this. Uh, this, uh, this page, this is the session API key page. Um, so I've just been granted this session ID after agreeing to the terms, etc. Um, you can see one example in, in the case of R. Um, there's a little example code here that could be pasted in um, that just says set my API key within this R session to this particular uh, API key. And that acts as my credentials. So I can then um, use that library, access data, and it's all um, logged and it's all tied back to those agreements that I made within the web UI. So another, uh, another feature we've developed this year is, and in fact, we've developed this month, we're in the process of finishing up this sprint, um, is the ability to electronically sign snapshots of data. Um, so the goal here really is to meet the requirements of CFR Part 11, or at least the electronic signature requirements. Um, in this case, the, uh, the process is fairly straightforward. Uh, you assign users the electronic signer role, and then they can sign snapshots of data within any data grid in the system, or just selected rows within that data grid, if that's of interest. The snapshot is then stored in immutable form, can't be changed, uh, along with metadata about the electronic signature. Those snapshots can be viewed, they can be sent to others, they can be sent to the FDA, for instance, um, and every creation and, and the viewing of those snapshots are logged. Let's do a quick demo of that. So I, here I have an assay uh, that is stored in LabKey. Uh, this is just sample data, of course, um, made up sample data, but we can see here that uh, we have an additional button here. In, in addition to export, uh, I can sign data. So I can sign an Excel workbook version of this, which will save a workbook and the associated metadata in it as custom properties. Or I can sign a text version of this. For instance, tab separ separated values um, in this case. I'll choose that because it's a little, a little easier to see the actual um, metadata. I must, in order to sign it, I must re-enter my credentials, my, my ID and password, and provide a, a reason. Ready to submit to the FDA. I submit that, and the snapshot is taken. Essentially, an export is created and stored in the database. Takes a second in this case. As I say, this is a feature that is under development. Ah, so perhaps, let me just double check here. I think indeed I have logged out of the system. I waited too long. So authentication still works. All right, let's try that again. I will switch to text. I will sign, specify my password. And submit. And that went a little better. So now we see details about that particular signed data. 
I can download that data and view it. And we can see the metadata is inserted as comments in the top. You can see here's the source schema and query, who signed it, when, what was the reason, ID, URL to access it, etc. Um, so that's all contained in the snapshot. And then if I want to, I can view previous snapshots that have been created, um, view those, send those on, etc. So let's quickly talk through some sample configurations. We've talked about all these different features. Um, how do they come together to uh, start creating a compliant deployment? So in the case of HIPAA, for example, you may choose to enable the activity dialog, specify corresponding terms of use, annotate your schemas, uh, your columns in your tables within your schemas with appropriate PHI levels, assign those PHI roles as appropriate, and then configure some specific uh, settings around PHI. For example, whether you want columns to be hidden or blanked. And you may want to enable API session keys um, if client libraries need to access this data. In the case of FISMA, we have implemented some specific features within LabKey to address the FISMA controls uh, or many of the FISMA controls that weren't already addressed by capabilities within LabKey. Our authentication, authorization mechanisms, logging mechanisms um, already addressed many of the controls, but we added uh, these uh, five or so new capabilities to address those specific controls. And we can look at those briefly within LabKey. Um, there is a compliance uh, setting from in the admin console that provides access to all of these settings. These are settings you may wish to enable in order to address those specific FISMA controls. So in this case, uh, I can choose to allow the creation of user accounts that expire after a set date. So if I want to provide um, very temporary access to my system where I know it will expire in say a week or a month, I can choose to automatically disable inactive accounts. I can choose to be notified or administrators can choose to be notified if some problem happens with audit processing. So we, since logging of events, audit logging is so key to compliance, we want to be notified if there's some problem with that process, if we were not able to capture every single event at the point that it occurred. And then I have a couple of options around logins. So if um, a certain number of, of consecutive invalid logins appear uh, or, or take place, um, we can freeze that particular account with this feature. Um, and then a, a very FISMA specific uh, capability is to accept only these, what are designated as FICAM approved uh, third party identifiers identity service providers. So in order to uh, address part 11, um, or at least the electronic signature aspect of, of part 11, um, fairly straightforward, enable the client compliance module in the folder where signing is needed, assign that electronic signer role to the appropriate people. At that point, um, they can create snapshots of data grids, just as you saw me do. So I touched on this at the beginning. Um, I just want to briefly uh, mention that we have, over the last year, built out, architected, um, and started running uh, several multi-server FISMA HIPAA compliant data centers on behalf of our clients. Um, so our systems engineering team takes on a lot of those responsibilities. Uh, we have, we're, we're starting to develop some economies and scale here. We have a tested architecture, we have automation, best practices, um, 
and experience to uh, create fairly cost-effective offerings in the way of, of compliant hosting. Um, and so this, you know, we'd be happy to talk to anyone there who is interested in, in having our help. You know, if you don't want to go through this process of uh, creating a compliant environment yourself or alone, please uh, give us a call and uh, we'd be happy to talk about options there. And then finally, as with anything, uh, this is a compliance, regulatory compliance features within LabKey is a work in progress. I've touched on a lot of the capabilities that are already there or are coming within the next month or so. Um, but we, as always, will respond to feedback we get from you, our clients, um, and from our own systems engineering team. That's one of the great things, uh, additional great things about having our compliant hosting offerings is that our systems engineering team is helping drive these capabilities and then giving us feedback when we add cap new capabilities to the system. Um, so it's a nice, nice feedback loop from them, but we also want feedback from you and how the features we've developed so far are meeting your requirements. That said, there are a few items here um, that uh, are kind of high on our list, our priority list, um, items that we're likely to work on over the next few months. Um, as I said, this is a 2017 objective and we're not done with 2017 yet. So we have a few more sprints to add uh, some additional capabilities to respond to that feedback and to um, really make uh, this uh, compliance functionality meet your needs. So with that, um, I will see if there are any questions uh, from the audience. Thanks, Adam. All right, everyone, if you do have any questions um, that you've developed over the course of the webinar, go ahead and submit those in our chat panel, or sorry, our question panel right now. We'll give everyone just a couple of minutes um, to submit any questions that you might have. Just a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this session, so if you want to follow up um, on the recording or share it with anyone, I will be distributing that. Um, recording via email in the next couple of days. So that will be headed your way. Um, quick reminder as well, we are um, about a month out from our LabKey user conference and workshop uh, that takes place in Seattle at the beginning of October. We will be covering some of our recent enhancements uh, to compliance during that workshop, um, as well as there's great time for just one-on-one -on -one um, Q&A with uh, folks like Adam and other members of our development team. So if you're interested in that, please uh, visit our website. Um, we have all of our speakers lined up as well as our workshops um, on our website. All right. And in addition, if you do have questions after the fact, feel free to reach out uh, to myself, KelseyG at LabKey.com, and I can get those uh, directed to the right LabKey contact to get them answered for you. Um, but it does not look like we have any questions that have come through at this time. So I will go ahead and say thank you again for joining us. Uh, have a great rest of your day.